All right, guys. So this is Adam coming back to you with another podcast. And right here in the flesh, I have Mr. Quinn Vitali. What's up, guys? Yo. So for those of you who guys don't know, uh, Quinn and I met about four years ago, um, actually through online coaching. Um, so and now Quinn is living uh, here in Utah with with me. Uh, so. I kind of just wanted to get Quinn on here to just kind of just talk through kind of what makes Quinn click to talk about kind of like his, his interests or got him into the fitness industry and stuff like that. So uh, first off, I guess, Quinn, how are you doing today? Pretty good. I just hit up Starbucks and drove around a little bit, filled up on gas and got uh, washed off the car, you know, just took, took Sunday really easy, really slow, um, kind of just enjoyed it. Didn't do much work, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, today was a nice day. Yeah, so I guess uh, just a gra- going into your whole car passion. So, what kind of started that? Um, so when I was younger, my my dad always loved like Corvettes and stuff, and he always like he always was really really into motorcycles. Um, and he always would tell me he wants a Corvette, but he's always had motorcycles. Like he he's always had this one ninety ninety six Panhead that he's had. For like, or is it a 50 or 46? Not, or, oh, I can't remember what it was now. Uh, really, really old, cool pan head. Um, it's a, uh, uh, what is it? Hand shift. You know, like most modern day motorcycles have a clutch on the left handlebar, but the, the motorcycle he has is a down by the side by the leg. You shift and then you use your, uh, your clutch with your foot, kind of like a modern day car. Um, but he's had like a bunch of different motorcycles and stuff. He's always been working on motorcycles in his garage and whatnot. And I was always very intrigued by it. So growing up, I was, I was always around engines and whatnot. And uh, as I started getting older, you know, I started be able, being able to drive at like 16 um, where I could get my permit. And uh, my first car was a turbocharged Volkswagen Jetta. And uh, I didn't, I didn't really, wasn't really into like, you know, the car scene that much. I was just kind of like, <laughs> I just wanted a car to drive, but. It was a turbocharged car, and me and my buddies may have drilled a couple holes into the uh, the intake manifold, and uh, you know, spray painted our plastic, dipped our rims black, rims black, and shit. Basically, you were very, very responsible with yeah. with the car. Well, yeah, and I mean, to be honest, the thing blew up like not even a year later. Uh, uh, you'll if you ever watched one of my YouTube videos, it was the beach day with Dave. Um, you could hear how my car would go. Just I would stay in third gear while I was driving. Well, that was the Jetta. Pretty much that car, um, its transmission shit out. It was an automatic automatic engine. But everyone was accusing me of driving a manual and not knowing how to drive because I was holding it in third gear. Little did they know, any gear past third gear was broken. And uh, I had to manually keep it in third gear to drive the car. Otherwise, it would just stop working. So um, that was my first experience with that. And then I ended up getting a Cobalt. And that's when I you know, started I was making a little more money. And I was like, all right, let me start throwing down pipes onto this, bigger fuel pumps, like bigger injectors, uh, uh, I was like, <laughs> smaller pulleys because it was a supercharged uh, four-cylinder Cobalt SS. And uh, I don't know, I just started, you know, I just, it just kind of came naturally to me. I uh, was around motorcycles a lot of my life and, you know, engine work and whatnot. And it's like a lot of my buddies were like into it as well. So it just made sense. Yeah. So I guess uh, if you had a, so obviously you, you have your, your Subaru right now. Yeah. Uh, so what what mods have you made made of that? Because I know that you've you put, did put a lot of work into that car over the years. So a lot, honestly, because like I, this is the first car I ever bought new. Um, uh, I wanted to like make sure. Okay, so like originally I wanted to just like soup the thing up and just start putting like massive amounts of horsepower into it. And then I started thinking, all right, I've seen the videos of people just cylinders or so, sorry rods just flying through um, the head of the engine. And coming through the hood of the car plenty of times in Subarus, specifically SDIs, because people, you know, they don't they don't um, get new internals, you know, and build up their engines appropriately. They just add more horsepower till they blow up. I didn't want to do that, and I wanted to kind of maintain my warranty. And uh, so, leading up to it, I pretty much I put a lot of exterior mods. I like debadged and rebadged it. Um, uh, what am I trying to think? I, uh, I have some wheel spacers. I actually have a mod list on my phone, to be honest. Let me pull that up because I had a whole plan for the car, um, originally of what I wanted to do. 
Um, so yeah, pretty much like I got it tinted. I got a front front place replacement, which inevitably I had to, I could remove now that I'm in Utah. I put some subwoofers in there. I got some uh, carbon fiber fender emblems and side badges. I got a nameless catback exhaust. I was I had an access port for a little while, but I was going to trade it in, so I started selling stuff. And I'm like, wait, I don't want to trade it in anymore. So now I got to get my access port back. Um, I was going to get a downpipe as well. I put on mud flaps, rain guards. I have a rear diffuser on it. Um, I want to get side skirts and a front lip. I want to get lowering springs. I put a little tow hook on there. Um, I want to get new tail lights and new headlights. Um, as far like mostly exterior mods and whatnot, I haven't done a lot to the engine itself besides an, uh, an AIG oil, oil air separator. So pretty much what that does is Supers have a tendency to uh, burn oil or spit oil or suck oil into the in intake manifold. So pretty much the purpose of the air oil separator is to, you know, the name says it, separate the air from the oil and redistribute back into the engine. So a lot of the times because these cars burn oil is because they're spitting oil into the intake and then it come, it enters into the, uh, the cylinder and then it burns up in the cylinder and you just lose oil. That's, I mean, there's been times where I've done oil changes and I've gotten, I put four and a half quarts in and I, when I do my oil change, I get about two and a half back. And that's because I wasn't topping it off um, throughout like driving. So I learned from that. Now I top it off. I always save like a half a quart, top it off uh, like halfway through my driving period before my oil change. Uh, but the air oil separator really helps with like um, making sure that you don't burn up oil as quickly. It doesn't fly into the intake. Uh, it doesn't enter into the cylinder and then it doesn't burn up in there. It'll redistribute it. It'll catch it before it gets there. Um, and, you know, also when you tune your engines and stuff like that, it's just going to burn. More. These engines just burn oil. So if you tune it for more power, it's just going to burn more oil. Uh, besides that, the air oil separator, I had an uh, intake. What is it? Cold air intake. And that was really fun. It made some really cool blow off noises. A uh, little, you know, the little zip, like, you know, the, the typical turbo noise you would hear with the blow off valve. Um, I had a, what is it, E-Tune, just, I forget what company I had it from, but uh, when I had my access port on, I would just get it E-Tuned, so it would, like, produce more power. I think I was pushing about <clears throat> 23, 22 pounds of boost, peak, that was just peak, and then it would taper off to about 19, but still, like, pushing 20, that's what scared me, that's why I started, I started taking the engine mods apart, because I still had, like, two, a year or two left in my warranty, and I was pushing, like, 21 pounds of boost on stock internals. And I was considering, like, how far do I want to push this vehicle before it blows up? So I was like, ah, I'll be safe for now. But now I'm out of warranty, and now I'm all for, you know, doing some mm -hmm. mods. Very, very meticulous, very slow about it. But eventually, you know, at some point, I'll build the engine up. Or I'll just get a fucking – I'll build a brand-new engine. That'll be, like, $15,000 for a brand-new engine, but it'll be it'll be bulletproof. You can literally shoot that, like, point blank with, like, a with a Glock. And it, <laughs> it will not be It's basically everything that you yeah. want. Yeah, too. yeah. So, titanium, full titanium, like indestructible. It can handle up to like a thousand horsepower. So, dang. <laughs> so I guess if you have a, like somebody like me, like say you know I wanted to start modding out like my, my car. I, I, for those of you who don't know, I drive a really, 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 really cool car. Yeah, it's a Honda Fit. Yeah, hatchback. <laughs> yeah. So if I want to start modding it, and like to anybody else who had like more like a normal car, you know, it's like like what would you recommend? Like kind of like starting off with more. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, because like from my, my, myself, when I were talking about this, this earlier, like I want, I kind of made the choice, like I want a Corvette or just this car because I kind of like, both, man. you can pay oh, this no, off. No, no, sure. No, like, like, like yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, have my drive around car and have my, my yes, cool your daily, your, yes, yes. Yeah. So like, say I want to have my, my Honda fit more modded out to make it like cooler and like last longer, be, be more, more durable. More reliable. What would you recommend? Hmm. Um, obviously like just proper maintenance and care of the vehicle, like, you know, always making sure like, um, you change your oil every, for most time for you, probably like every five, 6,000 is okay. Cause you're not driving it like aggressively for more aggressive drivers. Like I changed my oil every 3000 because I, I just, I'm a little more aggressive with it. Like you don't want metal shavings and stuff like that sitting in your engine for too long. And you know, it can cause, cause corrosion if, uh, if you're aggressively driving. So changing the oil quicker just helps. Yeah get that shit out of the car. But as, as far as like, you know, proper maintenance, um, yeah, just oil changes, like, like replacing your brakes on time. So you don't get down to the pads and then you start smashing up the rotors and then you have to get new rotors. And you know, that's a whole, 
uh, shit storm you don't want to go down to with your brakes. Um, I mean, outside of like proper maintenance, if you want to go into like just like regular vehicle performance, I mean, there's like a fine line. A lot of the times when you add things to the engine, you need to get it retuned. So you have to go. Mine's have only a four cylinder, for yeah. example. Well, so is mine. So. But like it, it doesn't, it's more so the size of the engine and like if there's any boost that's going into it. But like regardless, if you change anything within the engine, uh, you're going to have to get it retuned. So okay. they pretty much like you wanted to put a cold air intake in there, which I don't know why. I guess you, I guess like naturally aspirated cars, cars that don't have a turbo or a supercharger, um, they're just all engine power. Uh, I guess the cold air would still probably produce some good power boost. It's just most of the time from like boosted cars, the more air, you know, the faster the turbo spins, the more air the supercharger can pull in. But I think naturally aspirated, you'd still get like some good, uh, you probably might even get better miles per gallon out of it if you were to put a cold air okay. intake in there. Um, I may, I may be wrong, but besides that, like, you know, you could get better suspension because I'm sure it's stock suspension isn't yeah. great. Um, you could probably get like a little stiffer, more sporty suspension. So you'd have more grip on the road. Yeah. It's like, 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 like I can't turn like super like, you probably see a lot of body, a lot of bottom, a lot, a lot of roll. Yeah. yeah. So like, I mean like suspension, you know, new, new wheels and tires, definitely like making sure your tires are like. You have summer tires on right now, so that's great for this weather. But when it gets cold, you're gonna slide. Like yeah. I'll slide every time. slide, too. yeah. Like it's just because they're it's just strips. It's just like yeah. open strips. Well, all weather or winter tires, they're all jagged. You know, they have like the meat on them in uh, different patterns, so they grip into the snow or dirt or whatever it is you're driving on. Um, yeah, but besides that, there isn't like a ton of module. But of course, like you know, there's tint where you could preserve the interior. So most mostly would just would just be like, like like body mods. Yeah. Most of the times I wouldn't say you would go anywhere within the engine unless you wanted to get more out of your car, which you definitely could. I don't know a lot about Honda fits. I know a buddy that knows a lot about Hondas though. He built a seven over seven hundred horsepower Honda SI fifth gen, I believe it was. Uh, it was a twenty sixteen, I think that's the fifth gen Honda SI. And uh, that thing was nasty. He supercharged it, and then he turboed it. Wait, no, he turboed it. He supercharged it, and then he brought and then he put a turbo back into it. So he he's definitely had both yeah. sides of it. When it was supercharged, man, I've never seen a supercharged Honda Civic <laughs> until that. But that thing was nasty. I think I, I, I think you have like one, one of your vlogs. You really, probably you, you, you really showed that, and you're like, oh, sh yeah. yeah, John. And then he eventually he blew it up, and. <laughs> Because he, he literally actually blew two, two or three holes uh, through his engine block, which pretty much what happens is misfires. The piston, there's a misfire. The piston shoots off to the right or the left, and then the body just can't handle that pressure, that power, and then it just <laughs> blows out the side. So, you know, if a titanium, you know, fucking strong engine could take it, still wouldn't be good, but yeah. it could take it. But, yeah, misfiring is not great, and when, you know, shit isn't calibrated and tuned right, just blow holes in your head. Yeah, that's not good. A very expensive lesson, but he learned. He rebuilt it and got it back up on the streets, but he uh, <laughs> he's not looking for – I mean, dude, when you're pushing 700 horsepower in a front-wheel drive, you don't need that much. You're yeah. just going to spin anyway. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely diminishing the returns. Uh, so I guess uh, moving on, uh, let's talk a little about Coda because – uh, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, Coda, Quinn has a German Shepherd named Coda. And uh, basically, uh, what kind of made you just decide that you wanted to get a German Shepherd in the first place? Like, was it like actually like a, like a, was it like, was there like much thought under it or was it mostly just like, I want a dog and the German Shepherd seems like a good dog to have? So growing up, I had a, like, okay, so like, I was like, I was literally born and my parents had a, a German Shepherd Husky that was like three months old. So I pretty much, her name was Sox. Um, she had like little white feet, so they called her Sox. Um, so it looked like she had socks on. I don't know, it was cute. And growing up, I pretty much grew up with the dog. Like um, she was older than me technically by a couple of months. I think like she was three months when I was born. So I like from right out of birth, man, like I had a dog around me my entire life. And Sox was extremely intelligent, really smart, energetic, protective, very alert. She would just, I just have memories of her. We had this little den room that would go down from the kitchen and she would just sit on the very, she wouldn't be allowed up into the kitchen and living room unless my dad said so. So she would sit on the very last step before the kitchen, just staring out the window directly in front of her all day. She would just sit there. 
just watching. And if not, she would go down to the bottom of the steps, lay down and sleep. But still, she would just be, that was her whole dwelling down there. And then there was the, the laundry room to the back and then, you know, garage out to the side. But her laundry room, you know, would be where her crate and her like dog bowl and whatever it is. And then out back, you would be able to go out back. She had a little poop pen and, you know, we would go outside. She would pull me around on the sled because I, I thought she was, you know, she was a Husky German Shepherd. So I was thinking, oh, Husky. Okay. So I would grab her leash and I was like probably, I was probably eight or seven, something like that. I was probably like 50 pounds so she could do it. Um, and she would just pull me around the yard <laughs> on this sled when it would be snowing. Uh, and, and, you know, just like little memories like that, like really stuck with me. And uh, I remember how she was and like how, um, how just dedicated she was to the, like our family and like how loving and like, just like there's, there's something about like these types of dogs, man, that you just don't get out of any other dog. Like I've been around like tons of dogs in my entire life. Like I've, I've experienced probably, I've probably met every single dog breed there is nearly. And it's like still to this day, like I just, I just know the, the, the German Shepherd specifically is one of the most like loyal, compassionate, loving, funny, just, it's an amazing dog. It's the only regret I would say, because, you know, I'm giving all these positives. The only regret I would say about having a German Shepherd is not anticipating how much work it would be to keep them active, to play with them and to constantly, because these dogs, you need to constantly train them. It is a daily activity to constantly be on top of them. Outside of that, like, I've learned this now as growing up, you know, being a first time dog owner, you're not going to do everything correct. You're not going to be perfect about it. But the thing is like, I'm excited to get another one at some point because I know that dog is going to be even better. And it's probably going to fit with Coda. Cause I know probably when I get another dog, Coda will probably be like eight or nine. She'll be on her way out. I think German Shepherds only live to about like eight to 12 years, roughly or nine to 12 years, um, relatively short lifespan because you know, um, purebreds and whatnot, they have a lot of health issues as they get older and German shepherds themselves have, um, you know, hip issues. I don't think she'll have any, she hasn't shown any signs of hip issues. Um, and I didn't run her hard at all as a puppy. If anything, like I was terrified of her like developing hip, hip dysplasia. So I, um, I just wouldn't let her like run around at all until she was about a year old. I wouldn't do any strenuous walking, nothing like that. Um, and even like she had a pretty like sedentary life for, the first two years of her life for the most part. But I know at some point I'm going to get a second one and I'm really excited for that. Cause I just, I just love these dogs, man. And if it wouldn't, if it wouldn't, if it's not going to be a German shepherd, it would probably be either a golden retriever or, or a Doberman. I don't, I don't like the Doberman. I've heard stories about Dobermans too, but I just think they're so fucking cute, man. So I can't, <laughs> I can't like not turn them down. I don't know. Yeah, so obviously she's been like a really, really good support for you too. Just yeah. like, 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 like besides like you know all the you know, all the great aspects of uh, of the, the breed. You know, Coda is a uh, she's helped you out through a lot, and I think that's a really special thing. On um, you know, ever since you, you've been here, you know, like the bond that Coda has with you and the bond that you have with with her, and everything that Quinn's been talking about. Like I see that, and it's it's really special. It's something that you really you you kind of have to see and be around um and there's a lot of re like mutual respect i feel between both of you which i've never seen with lots of dogs and their owners it just seems like you guys just both you know you rely on each other so much you know you, you she, she reads how you're feeling you read how she's feeling and you guys both are like equally invested in each, in each, each other i think that's a really special relationship with any sort of pet yeah it's it's a different like man like you know everything has its vices, but God, I would never, I will never like not love and like regret my decision to get a dog, especially Coda, especially a German shepherd. And I mean, as like a warning, cause like a lot of people think they're super cute. They're super fun puppies. And they are, they're, they're crazy fucking puppies, but they're also like amazing dogs when you, when they grow up and they get bigger. And, um, I mean, like, I'm just saying this, you know, as they get bigger, cause as puppies, they're little assholes. They chew everything. They're loud. They yap, they whine, they complain. They just, <laughs> they, they're a puppy, but like on crack. Cause like, you know, they're, they're German shepherds, but, um, 
just knowing what you're getting into with any dog really and being a dog owner is like the most important thing definitely read up on your like read up on the breed you're getting talk to multiple people that have raised them because it's one thing to like watch youtube videos and read online but to look at like talk to people that actually physically raise them and hear their their mistakes and their their wins and whatnot is really going to help you with any kind of dog you uh, choose to raise i'm just saying german shepherds are completely different than most dogs um from the bond you will develop with them. They really only have one true owner and you'll figure out mm -hmm. who that is eventually. Um, most of the time it's the person that plays with them, feeds them, takes them out for walks the most. But once you have that type of bond with them, it's like you, you would never think a dog could love you so much. Let's be honest. Yeah. I, I'll definitely echo that, you know, like uh put getting a little bit more comfortable around me, but you know, you're still her person and the only person that she will really have. Um, and like, I know that you've had other people, you know, around, around her too, who are, you know, very, very close to her and, um, you know, she loved them too, but you know, it was, it was absolutely uh, different than it was with just Coda. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I guess just going back to, uh, I guess a little bit about, uh, fitness. So, um, you know, you have a massive transformation video. Mm -hmm. When you made that video, were you anticipating a response like that? Or yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the whole point of making a transformation is to go viral. Um, and back then, it's like no one knew how to go viral because it's like how do you make an impression on people? So it's like just make a transformation video. That's what everyone did. And I mean, I don't know. Mine probably has two and a half million at this point. And I mean, it, may, it, like, it sounds like a lot to me. And like, still, I think it is my most viewed video. Um, I didn't expect it to hit like 2 million. Honestly, I was hoping like just a big enough impression to like get my, get me, you know, out there. But yeah, I definitely made the video with intent. If that's what you're asking, made the video with intent for it to go viral. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So like when you started out, um, you, did you feel like you knew what you were doing or you kind of just like the whole eat big, get big men, men mentality or because, or like, and like, when did you know that you had like good genetics for this? Because this is a question I get asked a lot. It's like people want to like, well, like when do you know if this is something that you're going to be going to be good at? And I usually tend to say like, you'll know within like the first few months typically, if you are, if you're good at this and if you like us. Yeah. I kind of agree with that. Like I was always an athlete. Okay. So before I ever started lifting, I was, stronger than every single one of my friends and most of the people I knew I was stronger because I just from how many push-ups and pull-ups I could do how fast I was you know like the kids you, kids your age they compare each other's like abilities based on mm -hmm. like push-ups how fast you can run pull-ups like that kind of crap um jumping how high you can jump and pretty much I excelled at all of that and I was better than I mean like I was just better than everyone at yeah. some point and so I was like naturally athletic. I played like soccer and football growing up. I played multiple sports um, and whatnot. But when I started playing high school football, my first year as a freshman, when I actually found out that I was good at lifting and I had like the genetics to actually grow muscle was when I was benching and squatting as much as all and deadlifting all, as much as the linemen in my freshman class. And I had a response. Like I remember specifically the one day I was doing – cable t-bar cable rows and i was just rowing and then i looked to my right shoulder and i just saw striations all down like i was just lean i was very very lean my whole life i never had a lot of body fat i always had abs you know whatever and i just remember looking to my right and i just had striations in my shoulder and i'm like holy crap as i'm doing the rows and i think from that moment it made me realize i have a really good um, potential for this. I have an affinity for this. I uh, hope I'm using that right. Yeah. 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 Um, I have, uh, there's something, there's something that I like about this. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to keep doing this. So then from then on, I would just literally train every single day. It was a lot of bro training. I would just go into the gym and just smash as much as possible. Of just like make sure every single workout was as hard as, as hard as possible. I would do a mile run before I would train and then I would train. And then after that, I would do sprints for 30 to 45 minutes, just like resistance training or like agility training, um, just just constantly running and lifting every single day. Uh, I was probably eating at that age, at 15, I was probably, because my dad, I remember him complaining about how much I was eating. 
uh, he would just get so mad. He's like, dude, you don't need to eat this much, but you know, you know, bros and stuff, they don't understand like, you know, energy needs and whatnot. And maybe because he wasn't feeding me enough, I was just staying shredded all the time, <laughs> but I, I couldn't like grow efficiently, but I was probably eating around 4,000 calories a day at like 15 years old. I would, I would assume, um, I started lifting at about, <clears throat> I was probably 155, 150. And then after one year of training, I got up to 170, 175 as a freshman. Uh, going into my sophomore year, I, was, I think I was around 175, 179. And uh, I progressed like about five to 10 pounds every year up until my senior year. But, and of course, my calorie needs went up as well. And my parents hated it because every time at dinner, I would need three or four, por- genuinely three or four portions to like feed myself, like feel full. I would be hungry all day. So I would be just bringing snacks. I would eat like five, six granola bars all throughout the day. In between classes, during classes, I would eat two, I would get double servings at lunch. Um, I would get two chicken sandwiches, two fries, um, and whatever else they were serving. I would always get double the the serving size for lunch. Um, At breakfast, I would have a big like 800 calorie muffin, uh, 1% fat chocolate milk, about like, I don't know, two cups worth, whatever that is, or like 18 ounces, I can't remember exactly. How many ounces are in a cup? Six, 16. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No, 30, wait, I think eight ounces. Eight? Yeah, yeah it's eight, eight ounces, ounces in a cup. Yeah, so 16 is two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So two cups, 16 ounces, um, you know, of like just chocolate milk, which is probably around like 400 calories or something, depending on how much milk fat it is. Yes, yeah. Yeah. But still, like I would have like, a, you know, just big meals all the time. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and like you still do eat a lot. Um, but I think that's actually something like a lot of people do need to actually understand though, is that like, it's it like, somebody might, might, might be like, oh man, like you're so lucky to eat that much. But the reality is like, if your energy needs were only like 3000 calories a day, you're you lucky. wouldn't feel yeah. as hungry and you wouldn't have to spend as much money yeah. on food. That's nice. And you won't, and like, you don't have to like keep eating and it kind of gets frustrating because you're just like, okay, like, I have to keep eating. And then like other people was like, I remember like I was in, in like college because like I don't have a like a super fast metabolism, but like, I'm just more active than most people. So therefore energy, energy needs are bigger. Um, they'd always be like, you're eating so much food. I'm like, yeah, like well, I have to do this. Active, like I mean, yeah. times we're active, more muscle mass, more metabolic, you know, because the reason why like it's just science fact without them. Reason why muscle burns more calories than body fat is fat really just sits there as an energy reserve, but muscle is like always contracting to some extent constantly throughout the, the day. It's called muscle tetanus. But like if you have more of that going on, you know, you have to more to just maintain that. So, like, you know, I think that like one, one thing that Queen has done a really good job with 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 me, um, and always kind of was something I've really learned from Quinn. Um, is for those of you guys who don't know, I have a background of being anorexic and uh, whatnot for five years. Um, then I met Quinn, I hired him, he got me, it really is the reason why I'm here right now today, so thank you, sir. Um, yeah, but no <laughs> the thing is, Quinn's always been very focused on muscle, building muscle, gaining muscle, and only cutting like when you have to, or like if it's like a really, really, um, you know, a big, big, big need to do that. And I think that's something I would kind of want to delve a little bit more into your psychology behind that, because you have gotten to the point where you said, Hey, I've been big. I've been fat. I've been shredded. I've been everything. And I'm okay with all those points. And that's something that a lot of people aren't okay with. Now you're, you're always kind of naturally more lean the way you distribute body fat. You're always going to have some abs, but you also have an Instagram account and you make your money off of this. Like this is your job. So I guess like, how have you learned to, I guess, be okay with yourself throughout the phases? What has kept you focused with, that pursuit of size and like, like how do you basically go about making your own decisions with your physique and your um, strength and like what goals you have? Because I always think it's cool to see what makes successful people, people who have really, really good, good genetics and infinity for this, how do they make their own decisions? Um, so like I said before, like I was very, very lean starting out at training. So I guess to an extent I had a good opportunity to just build muscle mass and put on body fat. I know for some people, you know, they, they may start off heavier and you know, they try to figure out like if they should lean out first and bulk up this and that. To be honest, and this is like something I will always stick to regardless of my body composition. When I started getting back into training, let's just put it like this, about like five, six months ago, when I started like 
getting back into it, I was skinny fat, genuinely. Like, yeah, I had some muscle mass here, but like there was just a lot of body fat on me and just I was very uncomfortable with my physique. Um, so I can kind of relate to an extent to a lot of people that feel like they're skinny fat, they don't know where to go, they don't know how to make progress and whatnot. To me. You came back to the gym and you were yeah. skinny fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you can relate to, to, to everyone. That's where we, we, we left off. Yeah. So how I, my opinion on like, you know, myself and like how I want to grow and like how I deal with, you know, not being shredded, not being super bulked up, not being heavy, short, this, whatever, 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 wherever my physique is, I pretty much only have like one idea in mind generally. I want to grow. I consider that more important than anything. I want to continually grow. So what is the best thing for me to grow? And how do I shift my, my goals to accommodate for that? So now like if I want to grow, but I'm also like experiencing, you know, body dysmorphia or not or whatnot from like, you know, not being as lean as I would like or this or that, it comes down to the point of, okay, if I want to continually grow and get stronger, I need to be comfortable with putting on a little excess body fat. I may not be able to see my abs as well. My arms will just probably be just big blocks and slabs of meat, you know, or like my legs won't be striated and my glutes won't be striated, whatever it is. That's not going to be a priority to me. That's not what I consider progress, just depending on how lean I am. What I consider progress, especially when I'm trying to put on muscle is, are the weights going up? Do I feel fuller and stronger? Are my muscles harder? If I can, can if I can agree with all of those, and I feel that every single session is very good, and I'm fueling myself in a way that allows me to be stronger, okay, not stronger every session, but stronger progression. Basically, make adaptations yes. consistently. Improve. Yes. Yeah. And just growing and getting better month to month, week to week, whatever it is, I consider that gains. And then by the time you know, if I get to the point where my weight is up like ten pounds than it was the year before. Okay, clearly I probably put on some muscle, definitely some fat, but like I probably put on two or three pounds of muscle at that point. If I feel I'm too fat, I'll lean out, very slight deficit, you know, maybe between 200 to 500 calories. It's not super severe, but I'd still consider even 500 calories to be a pretty big deficit for most people. You'll feel it at some point. Meanwhile, I'm over here like, yeah, thousand get, calories. get out. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I've... More so anything, I, saw, I find it fun to, to, to pursue strength when um, I'm like, you know, in a bulk, what, what, what not. Mm -hmm. It's like strength to me is like the most clear cut sign that I'm like getting better and I'm progressing. It may not be, strength training may not be the most efficient for muscle mass, but in a way it will indirectly affect how much muscle you can grow over time. Yeah. The stronger you are, the more weight you can move, the more muscle mass you'll build. That's, that's literally the motto I've always stood by. Yeah, I think there's definitely a few, a few caveats to that. Obviously, there's a big technical component to, to strength, but yeah. um, especially if you're getting uh, like there's some really good data on like single joint exercises, like the, like your the curls, like a leg extension. If you could do more on like yeah. that, especially leg curls, like like I've noticed leg curls have been getting easier and stronger. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, my like hand hands are yeah. probably growing. Because like the thing is like with like something like a bench press or squat deadlift, like there's such a big technical component yeah. to that. You don't know it's just like your technique improving or, yeah. or whatnot, but like you know, like you know, that's actually something I have on my on my channel. I actually talk about. You know, people will always ask for like the strength equal size, and I say, oh, well, it depends on the context. And I would say like one to five reps. Yeah, like sure, like you know, you probably are gaining some muscle, but probably not as much. Typically, with volume over time, and like over time, if you can actually look across. Because the reality is, like, once you've learned, like, how, how to squat, bench, and deadlift through one exercise, like, beyond, like, that initial neural link learning stage, if you can still, like, add, like, five, ten pounds, like, a month or every two months on that, and, like, you're stronger over, over time, and your body weight's still up, then, like, that's a really, like, great sign. Um, I think something that you pointed out was, like, I just played the long game, and I just know that from myself and my goals where I really want to be. I just got to be focused on eating a lot. Um, and just understand like, Hey, like abs aren't everything and there's more to life than just having abs. I'm going to say real quick, like, I know a lot of people struggle with bulking and whatnot. I really fucking encourage you to like start cooking. I know it's going to suck and you're going to make a lot of shitty meals and waste a lot of money <laughs> at the start because you're just going to, you're just going to realize well, cook already. Up so bad, but like Microwave gen <laughs> genuinely, um, like when I was eating just massive amounts of Biscoff bagels and this and that, and, you know, just high calorie muffins, it wasn't really the diet I'd liked genuinely when I first started training. And to be fair, the, I, 
I have definitely bigger now, but at the time when I was eating like this and also, you know, highly active and whatnot, I was eating massive amounts of volumes of food that were quote unquote healthy, you know, like smart choices as well as being extremely active. Um, I find a diet like that where I'm eating a very wide variety of foods that are like, you know, very macro, macro friendly and very nutrient dense um, to be the best suited for me. And that's, I can find bulking easier that way, eating in a calorie surplus because it's all foods. I, I love red meat. So like, I know I can smash down a three, four, 3000 calorie meal if it has red meat involved in it. So like find <laughs> foods that you like cooking or like eating and like do that. Don't just eat foods because you know, your favorite fitness influencer eats them. I mean, that may work for them. They may, they may like that or they may hate it. In my opinion, I hated eating just massive amounts of like, just like this crap food. Cause it made me feel like shit a lot. But was I super full? Was I like fucking big and juicy, massive? Yeah, but it wasn't wasn't sustainable wasn't eating enjoyable. habits for me. Yeah, it wasn't enjoyable. So I definitely find like find something you know if you you know you don't have to learn how to cook, but whatever like you find sustainable, do that. Yeah, I think something else too is uh, that's what I've noticed with you is like you don't really track the super, super meticulously. But the reason why like you don't do that is because like you kind of just know your body at this point. Yeah, I've been training um, for ten years. Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, I've been eating. <laughs> yeah, and so like I think for a lot of people, you know. Um, in the in the beginning, like Quinn, you know, will tell you, you know, I absolutely got into tracking. You're probably tracking things like, yeah. you know, very, you know, pretty pretty strictly. You've done you've done cuts that were more like like so you're like you got some gnarly like like condition before. Um, like you, uh, I think that like, um, you know, you're learning your body over time, like kind of like what works best for you. Like I know that for myself, like. For example, based off of past data with like cutting, I like leveraging being a little more active over eating less. For other people, yeah. they like just, just eating less instead of being active. Um, you say, hey, I respond best to X, Y, Z. And I think that's like one of the big themes with like, essentially you self-coached yourself this entire time to understanding kind of what makes you click and like what you respond really, really well to on that front. Um, which is, you know, that's really like what coaches do is they really do actually help people um, because you have to be a different type of person to actually be able to self coach yourself the way that, that you have to this point. Um, so yeah, I think that you said a lot of really, really, really good things about just mindset and whatnot. And like for people who are skinny fat, like most of the, the, of the time, like it, we, we say just focus on building more muscle then, or would you say like, yeah, absolutely building more muscle, even if like you're quote unquote obese, if you just worry about putting on muscle, you'll see more more of a change faster than you would if you worried about cutting down. Especially because there's a new game, game component. Yeah. And assuming that you're coming in, into the gym and you're like, you know, not very well trained, you should probably gain more muscle. Yeah. Because it's going to pay off in the It's going to carry you further. The more muscle you put on earlier on, the more potential there is for you to lean out and still maintain it's that so muscle. much easier yeah. lean out with muscle mass. Yeah. Like, I get all depressed when I hear about these guys who are like 190 pounds, like skinny fat. And they're trying to like, lean out like, like, like 1,000 calories. calories. I'm yeah. like, dude, like, you're, what are we doing here? Yeah, there's like, no point. Like, what do you think is going to happen like, when you get down to like, you know, 170 pounds? Are you going to like the way that, 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 that you look? It's like, well, no, because you need to have the muscle. That's the hardest thing to tell clients. There's a lot, of, a lot of clients I have now that are like in this middle transition phase of being like skinny, fat, but like don't have a lot of muscle, but they want to just get lean. And it's like – we can do that, but like your calorie maintenance is like barely above 2K at this point. And it's like, I, I don't feel comfortable putting any mail in a calorie deficit There's no, under 2,000 calories. I, I agree, I especially like, like if you're, if you're a dude and like obviously for contest prep, like that's a different Yeah, level. that's different. But like, Not it's, lifestyle. But like it, it's like if you're like below 2,000 calories and you're just trying to get like each thing like 10%, which is shredded, like people don't understand. Like that's like like people who are on stage are four to six percent body fat. Ten percent body fat is four percent body fat above that. That's like if you're two hundred pounds, you get down to one ninety two and you're stage one. Yeah. So like unless you're like it's just like you should not be going below two thousand calories if you're probably doing that. Like you probably need to be a little more active or focus more on building more muscle. Yeah. I would it, the, before you put yourself into a crazy deficit, increase your daily activity and then focus on building muscle. And then see how your calorie needs change. If you can get up to a maintenance of like 3,000, I mean, I would say that's enough to say you could cut down 
you could drop it to 2,500. Pretty, pretty now. easily. Yeah. And it's like manageable. It's reasonable. It's not like you're starving yourself all the time. You can't go out to eat. I mean, you if, you, if, you, if you eat three meals a day, 2,500 calories yeah. is like 800 calories not, on average per meal. It's not, I mean, it's not much, meals. but it's like, those well, are still yeah, but decent if you, meals. If, if you choose right, 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 yeah. right, 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 like pop tarts, it's like, yeah, well, okay, that's half the meal right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Quinn, Quinn Vitale is, uh, the, the secret to his to his gains, kids, is pop tarts infused with uh with with trembolone sandwiches. I will say, I will say, I love a good turkey and cheese with uh you know bagel and cream cheese or pop tart, cream of wheat, oatmeal. You no, know, I, I will say that is that is one thing Quinn did, did did say like when you're bulking, there's something called so Quinn basically outlined the food palatability reward hypothesis. Basically, the more delicious that your food tastes, or that you enjoy it, the more you're gonna want to, what you're gonna want to, you want to eat it. So like when you're bulking, absolutely like eat like foods that you really like. Take advantage of that. Yeah. Whereas like when you're cutting, like me, it's like you know, eat more boring, bland foods with a little bit less variety. You're gonna just gonna help a lot with with hunger and cravings and whatnot. Like that like that's a big thing. And I know Quinn, like when you get get to that point, you're gonna start you know having less it'll flexibility. Be simple, it'll simple. it'll be it'll be like less of like oh like, what do I feel like having today? What's what sounds good? More like, well, this is what I'm going to have. It's just yeah. easy, simple. I don't think about it. It doesn't increase my, my cravings. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess. Got some I, chicken marinating in there. I can't wait to make yeah. it. Yeah. So again, like Quinn's, Quinn's excited to, to, to eat. And like that's that's a good thing. Um, I guess in terms of um, becoming an influencer, is you are even creating an online brand. You've done a very, very good, good job of that. Um, you know, you've. Um, obviously a big transformation video like you were like i have two and a half you're like you have two and a half million i have like just about two two thousand you know you you have a big reach on social media um and whatnot how would you recommend i guess building a following and creating a community of people around you that are invested in you first and foremost and this is going to be one of the hardest things for every single person trying to get into the fitness industry to do but it is the most lucrative and will probably if you have the right stuff, we'll project you into it and you'll just flourish. But connecting with people that are in the fitness industry, there's no other way, honestly, unless like you have freak, like you just are a freak of nature and just so unfathomably just fitness, everything like just shredded, strong, powerful, whatever, having someone, even when you are super those, Saiyan, essentially, yes, you need to, you need to ascend the super Saiyan pretty much. You need to ascend all expectations of life. And even then, if you have all that, you may still not make it into the fitness industry without your foot in the door. If you talk to any single person ever that has made it into any industry, the wrestling industry, the, 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 the movie industry, anything, they always said, this is the person they talked to that gave them their chance. And because of that person, it projected them into where they are now. So it's, that is the, if you, and I'm saying that's the tricky part because also it's like that dives into a realm of like, who's really your friend, who's not, who's just looking for like a, a win, a quick, easy win and whatnot. So I don't want to dive too far into that, but genuinely, if you want to make it into like any industry in the world, you need to have your foot in the door somewhere. Network. You need to know. Yeah. You, you need your network really does matter in every single industry or otherwise it's like you're gonna have a very hard time getting noticed um and algorithms fitting so like honestly it's just reaching out to people um not being like really weird and pushy and stuff not like bro can you follow me can you give me likes give me this and that that is the most the, the, that will actually ruin your chances of ever making it in any any industry when you beg when you beg for shit like that and i know it's like you don't know what else to do and it's like kind of difficult to like figure it out, but man, like you just need to work, literally work your fucking ass off to be the best version of yourself as possible. Be whatever you're pursuing, say in the fitness industry, whatever you're doing in the fitness industry, be, try to be the best there is at something in it, something, whether it's like being a really good cook and people love your meals and like, you, you know, maybe someone stumbles upon one of your videos, they try out your meal and they're like, holy crap, this is delicious. This is a scenario, but this is delicious. And then someone gives you a shout out, word of mouth that spreads. Or maybe you pull this nasty, crazy deadlift that's never been seen before at this Asian weight. So it's like, do something that is incredible and people will acknowledge you for it. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, it's, and what, what you, um, David and Dylan did essentially is, you were, you were the first 
you were you inspire like all these kids. I and I I, I think that's something that's amazing. Um, and something else too is like you know, Quinn says something really important there with work your ass off essentially. It, it's it, it, in the, it, you know it's, you gotta love it. It's you not really it's not the sexy it. answer. It's like you have to work your ass off it, and you have to love exactly. Because like if you don't love it, like why not, yeah. why are you going? You're not going to try hard. Yes. Like exactly. this, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk uh, actually talks about this. He says laziness is actually not a bad thing. If you pay attention to what you're lazy at, it's probably what you shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. And then stuff that you're like that you aren't that you are, have like drive for, like work your ass off of that. Yes. Like like for me, like that was like 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 music and. You know, lifting weights, and I love like helping people out. It's like I, 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 I love all helping. of that, and that shows your passion for it all. Yeah, and like that's why you know, like you know, we can work hard, and like you know, like that's why, like for me, it's like you know, it's like you know, I, I do powerlifting, and the powerlifting training does take a little more time than bodybuilding training, just just because of the nature of the energy systems that you're training. Um, but it's like if you don't love it, you're going to do that three hours of training as 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 work, and that's another just one side note. Um, whatever form of fitness, it doesn't have to be body, it doesn't have to be power, it can be cross, it can be yoga. Be it lifestyle. Be like, just do something that you like. Yeah. Because you know what? You might not like this. You might not be very good at this. And that's okay. Like, it, it, this is something I've told, told Quinn. Like, it'd be sad if like, Bill Gates was like, I really want to be like a really, really fast runner. And <laughs> we never got Microsoft because he just, he just focused <laughs> he just on like, run. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, like, I don't know. Like, don't, like, like everybody has their own adaptive proclivities. But I think something really cool about fitness, though, is that everybody can get better yeah. and even if you might not make it in an, in an industry like the fitness industry because it's a shark tank it is yeah. um everyone it's been when i got into it it was highly saturated and now it's just fucking with tiktok and all this <laughs> crap there it is so saturated i don't even know there is just uh, everyone's a fitness influencer at this point and online coach <laughs> and online coach. yeah everyone's a co- yeah yeah so like i don't know i guess niche yourself find what you're good at like what makes yeah. you special and even if you're not entirely good at it, if you still love it and you still enjoy it, continue to do yeah, it. Yeah, there's man. nothing wrong with just posting for yourself. Like, yeah. like, like you know, people like, I, like, like, you know, I don't have like a massive following, but like, you know, I have like, like, I'm just just under 28k. I so, uh, that's still a pretty big following if you really think about it. There's a lot of people that try to sure, but like, I never started it out with the, with the intention yeah. of wanting to get a big following. It just comes. I just you. wanted to post. I was like, literally, like, like Quinn hyped me up. You post a transformation, and I was, hey, I'm kind of good at this. I'm kind of naturally strong. I seen it, you know, and I'm, I just enjoy this a lot. I'm just going to start posting my progress, and I did it for me. Like I got a ton of shit at first for doing. It. I'm sure that you did, you did too. But like the reality is, like those people that gave me shit and are asking me like for help. Yeah, well, that's how it always starts. They, you know, they're uh, what the hell, what the hell, and then they keep seeing. You're a narcissist. Winning, 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 winning. I'm like, yeah, like I'm good at this, like. Yeah. And by the way, narcissism isn't bad. I don't think narcissism is bad. I think it depends on how you use it. Yeah. Because like you kind of have to believe that like you're the shit. Yeah, you kind of have to hype yourself up. But like, don't buy so much into it that you don't become like a, like a bad person. Yeah. Um. You always like remember like where you came from and stuff like like that, and stay humble because it's just like you know pressure's a blessing. You have to have a good voice in your head, man. Like pretty much like you got to always be supporting yourself. If yeah. Anyone, supporting mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. I actually why I wanted to, to talk to you about that. Like with like self talk and. and and, and, and whatnot like how do you get through um down periods like what do you like, like you know just, you you've had a lot of uh, adversity especially like you know the past few, few 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 years like what do you think has kind of like kept you going and like for anybody else who might be listening to this you know who is going through a, a rough time like what would you recommend it to, to them to just help get them out of that like, dark place so there was this one saying that really i mean it's so simple too it really is simple but like if you genuinely do believe this like it will change your outlook because have changing your, your perspective on the world and your outlook on everything around you will probably be the biggest influence for you. But just believing, and this is pretty much what I, you know, have to remind myself all the time, but just believing that no matter what happens, you'll be okay. Every single time, every single day, just remind yourself, no matter what happens, you'll be okay. And as long as you believe that you genuinely trust that process, you will always be okay. Always. The, the moment you aren't okay is when you stop believing in yourself, you have this self-doubt, and you just completely cr- crumble under the, the pressure. And I mean, a lot of times, you know, everyone deals with, like, everyone has trauma. Everyone deals with trauma in some type of way. There's some crap that someone that you go through that is just painful. 
And it's just believing that no matter what, I will be okay. I will be fine. Sticking, that has been one of the biggest, I guess, mottos through my entire life. Or when I came across it, and even when I was in like rock bottom, feeling the worst I possibly could, the one thing that helped pull me out of there, besides like, you know, meditation and mindfulness and like becoming aware of my own, you know, emotions and reactions is just knowing that no matter what, I'm going to be okay. So, I mean, if you're going through some crap, just self-talk is extremely important and reminding yourself that no matter what happens, things are going to turn out okay. Yeah. Um, because, you know, Quinn and I will always talk about, you know, like we get self-doubt just like anybody else. Yeah, I mean, and like, I, I also think for like having a good emotional and like, I, like have a good circle of people. I was like, at least like one person that you really do um i guess trust and like surround yourself with because i think that having people around you who one actually truly do care about you and you'll learn that over experience who those those people are how their actions are and whatnot but like also just like because like when, when things do get bad like reaching out and acknowledging it and yeah. like not getting caught in your own feelings because i think sometimes we kind of will get like i, I think like, like like for me if I stay in my head for, for, for too long, Quinn's no this with myself. Like if I'm going through shit, I talk about it. That's how I get through it. Is I know if I just have it in, I, I like, I, 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 I it will literally well, explode yeah. and I just don't feel good. Yeah. Speaking about it. And like, another thing is like, if you feel like you don't have anyone to speak to about some stuff, like say like your parents just literally just have no idea what you're talking about, or they're dealing with their own problems or your friends are, they're just oblivious to it and they're dealing with their own problems or they just can't relate at all because they've never experienced what you're going through, whatever it is, if you feel truly lonely, like you are weird, you are an outcast for feeling this type of way, just just reach out, man. Just reach out to people. Try to keep connecting. Don't get discouraged just because the closest family member or friend doesn't understand you. There's someone out there that cares. There's someone out there that understands and someone, someone, there's someone out there that has gone through what you've gone through. And even if they don't even know you, man, like I'm not, trust me, I get a lot of DMS every single day, but when I see messages from people that are going through shit that I've experienced, I 100% respond to them every single time. And it's because I know what it feels like to feel lonely, lost, you know, no one understands. Like it's, it's a shitty feeling. So the best thing I can do, I'm not, I'm not also, I'm not saying don't reach out to me with all your Problems and whatnot. Too much because, Ali Rush. Okay, <laughs> I'm sure, not a ther therapist. <laughs> looking for us for sessions. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a therapist, but I will do my part in you know trying to be there for someone and directing them into a better future and giving them like my my opinion and my recommendations. And most of the time, I really do recommend going to therapy or speaking with someone that understands you know what you may be going through or you know can relate to in some type of way. Uh, also, you got to be careful. If you are going through something like that and someone else is going through something like that, be careful with how much you interact with each other because sometimes that could be a cause of a yeah. neg negative spiral and that could actually pull you both down. It doesn't mean you ignore each other, but you just express that like, you know, you're both going through it and you're there for each other, but don't, don't uh, press into it too far than, than it needs to be. Just always look for, you know, a, friend, a helping hand to reach out to and be always be open. Yeah, something that you that you know I've I think the reason why like you and I just became friends and why we still are friends is because you kind of, you and I kind of balance each other out like like we're both kind of similar in you know lots of different ways we also think about things diff differently and it helps provide different perspectives yeah um and yeah I think open communication is a really important thing you know just you know um, understand too that like you know kind of just like what, what, what Quinn said like trust that things will be okay. You're going to be okay. This, you know, life comes in, in seasons, and uh, you know, as long as you just keep working, you keep positive, and you keep like trying to find things that are good about life, instead of just giving up and listening to those, those voices. Usually, things have a way of uh, of working out pretty well. Um, because I know that for myself, like when I came to Quinn four years ago for 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 coaching. Um, I was in the worst spot of my, of my life. I, I had tried therapy. I tried all these things. And then, you know, for some reason, I was like the only person that really could get through to me. And I would never thought in a million years that, you know, that person turned to like basically like, you know, one of my, one of my, my, my closest friends and biggest you know, influences on my entire life. So, um, and again, that just became because I reached out, you know, I asked for help. I, and you know, it wasn't like I was, I went into this with like the whole entire like mentality, like, Oh, like, 
and Quinn are going to be friends. Just like, well, I need to do something for myself and it make me feel better. And that was weight training. That's another thing too. Like find something that makes you feel good. Yeah. Something that like is a, a bit of like a stress reliever, what, whatever it is. Like, you know, I love weight training as well, but I do love driving as well. And like both of them are like a big stress reliever. I'll mm -hmm. go on drives when I, when I feel I need it, you know, and training, I love training. I love the feeling afterwards as well. So I agree with that. Yeah. So I guess it's just to, add, to end the, the, the salad, uh, What's next for Quinn Vit Vit Vitali? Uh, I want to compete in my first physique show, smash it, and then compete in a, a powerlifting so meet. So physique, a week as after, in men's physique then... or uh, women's physique? Women's <laughs> yes. oh, oh, wellness, yes, wellness. <laughs> Wait, I shouldn't even. <laughs> yeah, wellness. Um, yeah, I'm probably do classic physique. Uh, we'll see. Actually, really, maybe like a men's physique crossover into classic physique. They're both basically these actual yeah. sizes. It's yeah. So. so it's like I just put on, take off the trunks and put on the boxer briefs, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and then ideally, like after that, uh, I would like to compete in a powerlifting meet a little bit down the line, like you know, quote unquote, my off season, because I'm only gonna prep down once, cut down once, get insanely shredded once, probably once or twice a year at most. Um, and then outside of that, I'm just going to focus on strength. Like I've always had whenever, you know, like I've always gone through these phases of, you know, getting extremely lean, you know, holding that for a couple of weeks and then, all right, time to bulk up boys and get big, get strong, you know, jacked up. So yeah, I'm probably going to start doing a little more, I guess I'm going to really get into the fitness, 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 like competition, not because I've never really competed in much besides one powerlifting meet, um, that I broke a state record for in New Jersey. But I'm not really satisfied with state records. I kind of want something. I want like a national record bench, man, which is I feel like I could totally do. Yeah, these which two is, XRs. Yes, and that's the thing. Like I, if I, bro, like uh, if I stay like healthy, man, I genuinely believe I could put up like a six six or four sixty, four seventy five something bench. I in, believe like, it. This, in in the next like six months, eight months, something like that. Eh, probably eight months, I would say within this year sometime around them and then next year who knows like i don't even know what the national record is for like an 80 what is it 81 kg yeah i, really I think john hack holds it or something what is it like a five something oh, five like john hack oh. it sounds scary but i genuinely believe like if i'm healthy bro i could probably do something crazy but yeah i want to compete in like classic physique and powerlifting at some point again i want to make that happen yeah quinn's on a train block right now with a uh, kind of going to do something special with his bench a little bit different Peaking strategy just to be able to kind of see what happens, but uh, yeah, I guess just keep getting strong, get more aesthetic, grow, 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 grow coaching yeah. the business, uh, get a little more, more content out. Basically, comeback season, baby. Yeah, it's good vibes. Yeah, so it's been a good comeback so far. Yeah, I'd say so. Ahead. You're like your heaviest. You've been like the most comfortable at this weight too, right? Yeah, uh, I'm more comfortable, honestly, in the 80s, like 185. I like the most just because I'm naturally more athletic, so I like being a little more nimble. Yeah. Um, I don't like feeling as heavy because I do – genuinely, I feel heavy all the time yeah. when I'm in the 190s. Um, but, you know, we'll over, see. Over, over time, we'll make, we'll make 190 the – Yeah, the comfortable. The, the, the comfortable <laughs> over, over time. But, uh, yeah, that'll, that'll take time. But, uh, yeah, so I guess uh, it's been about an hour, so we'll kind of stop yapping. But, uh, Quinn, where can they find you? Oh, uh, you can check out my IG at Quinn underscore Vitali or my YouTube. You just honestly, my IG, you just type in QWIN and the first name that pops up. Uh, YouTube, same thing. My name's really weird. Just type in QWIN literally in any social media platform and my name will probably pop up and you'll know it's me. So, you're in, <laughs> so no OnlyFans? No OnlyFans yet. Um, any, any, any plans? Oh, you, you said you, you said yes. Yeah, so I've been getting it's a lot coming. of DMs about it. Uh, you know, so no I'm, pun intended with, 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 with coming. But yeah. <laughs> anyways, on this, on the excellent note, uh, we'll leave you guys, uh, and I'll have all of Quinn's, uh, deets in the uh, show notes with, uh, only fans waiting list. So yes, sir. Sign up. Yes, sir. So, uh, yeah. Uh, talk to you guys later. Goodbye.